Father, we, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you for the team, for the family, for the encouragement we get by being around each other. We know, Father, that that's the Holy Spirit working. So, Father, bless this day. Bless this worship. Bless this time. Bless these people, Father. We thank you and praise you, especially for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's worship Amen. people. Hello. I am. I
prayers on Jesus. I pray that if there's any distractions in the place in your life, um, that you'll be just like the disciple on the water who's um, fixing his eyes on Jesus as he's walking on the water. And when you get distracted, when you look away, you're going to drown. Um, but if you keep looking at him, then you're going to continue. You're going to be the only one who got to walk on the water, right? <laughs> so uh, let's worship. <laughs>
uh, verse 23 through 26. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. This is Paul speaking. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Exactly. Can you guys hear me in the back? Right? I, my... okay. I just, I was thinking yesterday, um, and, it had, and I feel like this hit me really hard. It's a really cool thought. Um, a lot of times, I've, I've definitely said this, we probably all said it, like, man, I just wish I was alive when Jesus walked here. Because that would have been so cool. Actually, to really see him, like him there in the flesh, to see the blind eyes open, to see uh, just all that he did, to see the Pharisees, the way that he spoke, and the way that he taught with authority, like, I wish I was there. And I was thinking about that, and I'm like, it's true, like, I wish I was there too, like, that's a, a really solid thought to have, but I was thinking about, like, that was the first generation that, that saw Jesus, the first generation that knew coming. I want to propose to you that we, or at least your kids, maybe someday my kids, might be the last generation. Isn't that kind of cool too? We might be the last generation. Jesus, in, in Acts chapter 1, it says he ascended in the clouds up back to heaven. But before, you know, the angels, when they came, they said, why are you staring up there? He's, don't you know, he's going to come back down the same way that he went up. He's going to, we, they got to see him ascend in heaven. We might get to see him descend from heaven. They got to see some blind eyes open. We might get to see nations have their eyes open to Jesus Christ. To have their eyes. They, they got to see like this cool shake up in Jerusalem. We might get to see America totally revived. We might get to see revival in a new generation. They, they saw Jesus come down and we were going to someday see him split open the skies and return for his bride. And I just think that's such an incredible, such a powerful um, scene. We know the scripture in Esther, you know, you, you, you were here for such a time as this. And, and I just want to be excited about the time that we were put on this earth. I want to be excited about the youth generation that I believe God is raising up. Um, his, his, his last days are me. And I think it's such a blessing. And, you know, so Paul said, when we take this communion, take it and proclaim my death until I come back. God, we just love you so much. We thank you that we can just be here today and we can worship you and we can be the people that say, Lord, your, your death and resurrection, your judgment is actually a good thing for me. We can be the people who say that, that you died for me, Lord. And even though there's all kinds of noise trying to distract us from your presence right now, Lord, uh, I, I thank you that you just love us so much. But God, I pray that we can just be a people that just worship you, a people that love you, a people that are devoted to your body, and Lord, a people that just share the good news, Lord, and so you can back to us. We just thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. And so, uh, in that time, on that last day, on that time, in the, in the, the, with the disciples in the upper room, he said, uh, I want you to take this bread. I want you to remember what I did for you. And let it speak louder to you than what the world does with you for you. Let's take it. And I love it too. He has the cup and he says, this is the blood of my new covenant. Like this is the new covenant. The blood I shed for you. It's sealed. It's done. You don't have to question. You don't have to worry. I've already paid the price for you.
So, Father, we, we trust you and thank you that you're all powerful word, Father, we hear today. We love you. Bless this family and flock today like, like no other. And we'll give you praise and glory no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so, so guys, we're, we're in the book of Romans. And last week, chapters 1 through 6, kind of went through it somewhat quickly. So that was the first coat. First coat. You know what happens when you do the first coat? You know, you need to do a second coat typically. All right, to get all the spots and thin areas out. Well, that's what we're going to do. And, and to be honest with you, this particular book, Paul's theology, the power of the gospel, is, is it's all through it. It is, it is deep, but there are some serious themes about the gospel that we need to flesh out, that we need to make sure we, we can handle. Because the majority of people out there cannot handle it. But, but I believe that you guys are ready. And so we're going to dive in. Second coat, Romans. Now, now listen, let, let me just read the, 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 the key verse starting out in chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is real from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so one of the themes is... That the unrighteous, they're going to face God's wrath. And I know, I know you guys are like, no, no more God's wrath. I mean, I, I heard about it last week. Some folks were like, can you take it easy on, listen, the first, the first five chapters, it starts, you start to see some light and relief and, and more. But listen, just hang on. Because if, if, you, uh, if you felt like this was going to be a feel good one, it is not. All right? So just hang in there and, and, let, and let's do this. All right? Listen, you don't want God's wrath, obviously. Well, then live righteously. You, you, you don't get his wrath when you live righteously. Well, how is that possible, Pastor? You can't live righteously without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables you to live righteously. Well, how do you get the Holy Spirit to make a decision for Christ? You accept him as Lord and Savior. You get the Holy Spirit. Now you have the capability to live righteously. Will you still sin? Yes. It's not like once you make a decision for Jesus, you automatically become sinless perfect. No. You just sin less. The desire to sin and the flesh is weakened. It drains from you. You don't sin as much. It's just that simple. If you're serious. Now, if you're losing that battle, we'll talk. The reason you're losing that battle is not God's fault. It's the Holy Spirit in you that you keep suppressing, quenching, and grieving. That's what happens. So it's not on God, it's on you. Now, okay, Pastor, take it easy. This is a wrath message again, and now you're blaming me for everything. Listen, we have to own up to it. We, we gotta be able to scramble. I appreciate you guys being able to scramble. Every time we're talking, the, the flock can scramble. I mean, that's life. Life is a scramble. So how are we as leaders if we don't provide opportunity for you to scramble? All right? Yeah, some of the stuff that, because of my style, times fly by the seat of my pants, sometimes, okay? All right, and, and, and so, yes, there's some scrambling that goes on. But what do you think the third world brothers and sisters have to do when they scramble? If they don't scramble, they get their head chopped off. I, I think sometimes, guys, we're a team that's soft. 
you know, when it comes to scrambling, we want things just perfect. That's not life. That's not the Christian life for sure, because you got to scramble. As a believer, get ready, you're going to scramble a lot more, a lot more. But we have to understand, and this is a big thing, that God's wrath is going to be leveled on the unrighteous. That's it. And so, here's the problem. So many people say, I am righteous. I ain't unrighteous, so I don't have to worry about it. And your righteousness is going to apply to you, but your righteousness doesn't apply to my righteousness. And we love wrath when it takes care of our enemies, don't we? Yeah, bring the wrath, God, because that person deserves it. Bring it. And we, are, we love wrath when wrath is leveled against people who hurt the innocent. Don't we love that then? Yeah, there better be wrath. But all the injustices, every single one, all of them, little, big, extreme, awful, insidious, not one will escape the Ancient of Days. Not one. They will all answer to God's perfect righteousness. His justice will prevail. Well, we like to see it now. We would like to be a part of the justice. You're not. You're not going to be a part of the justice. You're just not. Your responsibility is to live righteous in the Lord. You have to have him as Lord and Savior first. I know that this picture is what, of God, is what turns people away. That, that you say, people, he's this big cosmic killjoy. Your God is a big cosmic killjoy with an emphasis on kill. Who, who would want to serve a God like that? Well, here's the issue. So many people just simply do not know him. See, when you truly know who he is, not only will you love him, you will worship him. What's that look like, people? You hear the word, you believe it. You confess, and that's the trouble. That's the, that's the one area that's really a problem, the confess part. Then you repent, you get baptized, you rise and walk anew. So God's focus, his wrath, his wrath is focused on three groups of people, all right? It's focused on the godless, the agnostic, the godless, I'm good, I don't need God, I've got my own God, all right? His wrath is focused on them. It's also focused on the wicked, the ones that know. I don't care. I know I'm doing wrong. I don't care. I want to do what I want to do. The wicked, their intent, their heart. And it's also the wrath is focused on the religious. So be careful. Be careful. Check yourself because the religious will be, yeah, get them, God. The wicked and the gods, go get them. Me, however, I'll take my place in the jury box. That's where I'm going to be. The wicked and the godless, good luck for them. They're the defendants. They're in big trouble. Case closed on them. And guess what? We get to decide that. No, you don't. No, you don't. So, it says here, and, and let's, let's just read. For the wrath of God, in, in verse 18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Do you, do you see men suppressing the truth nowadays? Do, does anyone see a man or people in power suppressing the truth? Okay, you, do, does that not happen? Absolutely it's happening. And so his wrath leveled against people, men who suppress the truth. And their response to that, their response, they don't want him. The Bible says that the fool says that there's no God. A fool says that. And what did they do? If you read through this, it says they exchanged, they exchanged God for the world, for mortal man, for birds, animals, creepy things. They exchanged the eternal God for this temporal stuff that does not last. It all burns. What's, what's the first commandment? Way back in the very, in Exodus, what's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. And what have we done? It, it, it's even on your list. They exchanged the truth for a lie. They would rather serve, and we do it too, people, so check yourself. They would rather serve anything but God. And so in, in Romans, we see God gives them up. So, so starting in verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Now, now guys, hang, hang with me, because this, this, this gets tough. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. 
men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind, corrupt mind, evil mind, sinful mind, to do what they ought not to do. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malicious. They are gossip, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to their parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice that stuff, such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Wow. Wow. See, history will repeat itself, and it has many times. What destroys a people? What brings down a dynasty? Just look at history. It, it will tell you, because it has happened many times before. The first thing that happens is there is a removal of God. Get God out of there. Get him out of there. E everywhere. Then name a place where you can find God. It's even happening here. Move God out of the church because it happens in schools, the workplace, corporate America, obviously the government. Now churches are seeing it. God is moved out of that culture. No God for you guys. Nope. Now what happens? When you do that, when you take God out of the mix, all the while you're taking God out of the mix, this insidious process plays out we see the moral foundation begin to crumble. A sexual revolution occurs. We, we saw that, right, in the 60s. That's happening. That's happening here, people. We see that. You can love whoever you want. Love conquers all. You can do anything you want in the name of love. Love is love. Love cannot be wrong. And it is never sin. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because after that sexual revolution, comes a homosexual revolution. And I know, hey, pastor, pump the brakes there. Because I, I, I have people in my, in my family that are gay. I have friends that are gay. And I'm sure you guys do too. Uh, but but here, here's what's happening. When you move God out of the church, what happens is the pastors tiptoe around that before they even say anything. And then when they say it, it'll be a quick, fast read, and then that's it. Okay, I don't want to read the, the beat em up scripture about that particular sin. It is sin. Pastors cannot tiptoe around that because that's the next step. 30 years ago, we would never have thought that that would be something that would be acceptable and mainstream. Now, you, you better be careful, people, saying anything about it. You cannot. And I understand the sensitivity and the divisiveness of this issue, but let, let, let's just call it what it is, okay? You, you now offer any biblical insight, position, or stance versus the homosexual movement or the gay agenda, you get yourself canceled. You can go to jail. In Canada, you'll go to jail. And, and my opinion right now does not matter. So we have to talk about what God's word says. Not my opinion, but what God's word says. I know. I know this is tough. I know this is a sensitive issue. But, but as a believer, as a Christian, this is not a civil issue. It is not. And that's what happens. The, 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 the homosexual movement says it is a civil thing. But we say it is a moral thing. It is a moral issue. It is not a civil issue. So we have to deal with it how God's word says you deal with it. See, the proponents of the agenda always want to make it civil because then where does it go? to the courts. And then what happens? The courts, more than likely, they win. It, it's just that. And I know, Pastor, you're making this a, a, a us versus them type of thing, but, but listen, let me tell you something. Real love speaks truth. The truth in love. Truth divides. We model our Lord Jesus, the Prince of Peace who brought a sword. And, and we've got to be careful. See, when, when we share with a homosexual the, the, the whole, the whole uh, idea of the homosexual community is, is problematic, too, because it's sin. And, and homosexual is not a noun, but a verb, when you think about that. We don't say the adultery community, we've got to take it easy and be able to speak to the adultery community, or, or the lying community, or the deceiving community, or the unforgiveness community. 
So, so we have to be careful how what we say gives a, okay, it, it's fine, it's okay. And I know this is tough. We, we have to approach it like Jesus, when he was faced with the woman caught in adultery, he did not condone, he did not condemn. Jesus said to the woman, caught in adultery, go and sin no more. I know the problem, you can't, you can't compare adultery and homosexuality to sin. The Bible calls it shameful lust, sin. In many places, you can't, you can't get around it. See, the power of Jesus' directive of go and sin no more was set up not by him condemning her. Now, we have to balance this. She saw and experienced his wisdom. Remember, how, where, where, where have your accusers gone? And before, he's, before that, he said, he would, without sin, throw the first stone. He saw, she saw his experience and his wisdom, his mercy, and his grace. So that means, people, you do your research biblically when it comes to this issue. Be wise in the word. Know how to respond with the word. Don't be puffed up with knowledge. Respond the way Jesus did. So we balance our interactions with the homosexual community. What? We don't condemn them. All right? We do not condemn them. But we don't tiptoe around what the Bible clearly calls a sin. This sin is open rebellion to God's design to be fruitful and multiply. That's a big part. God's the one who invented sex. Sex, a big part of sex, beautiful, but designed to procreate. This blows that completely out of the water. All right? It's holy. It's beautiful when you follow God's design. But when you don't, and I bet you the majority of us in here, when you don't, can see what happens on a flip. Pain and suffering. If you go outside of God's design for sex, get ready for pain and suffering. The biblical stance on sex is very clear. But if, if your voice is in favor of God's word as, a, as it is opposed to homosexuality, then be ready to be shouted down when you're That's what's going to happen. Are you ready for that? Are you ready? Because after the homosexual movement comes the transsexual movement. And, and you think that's new. It is kind of a, some of the stuff like the, the, the letter community, the ABC community of, of what, what's going on in that movement. What's going on in that movement? That you talk about a cultural construct that man created all that? Well, well, it's really not. It's been it's been way back in the Old Testament. Do your research and see what it says about even dressing like a like a woman. Just see what what that is for a man to put on women's clothes in the Old Testament. What what that gets you? It, it has been around for a long, long time. And and what. The Bible says what happened is that people will call good evil and evil good. And the lunacy is being pushed everywhere. Everywhere you look. What does that plus mean? The LGBTQ, whatever, plus. What's that mean? That means evil adds too. Evil adds. That they're, they're going to include more. And, 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 and stuff that you would say, boy, that, this, this would never, ever happen. It's happening, isn't it? You ever hear of the term map? Minor attractive person, you know what society and culture is leaning towards? That kind of feeling would be okay. Be, be ready, be ready for that. Be, be ready for that. So, so you see what is happening to society, okay? The moral decline. What, what about the worst thing you can possibly do? When all those false, fake gods did and required of their people, sacrifice your babies. Does that happen in this country? Absolutely, it does. Where are we, people? What, what, what's happening? You look at that list of all that sin, all that evil, that this is God's wrath leveled on wickedness. Then you see this one where it says, being disobedient to parents. That kind of, I mean, what in the world? But that's where it starts. That, that's where, if, if the kids even have parents, that, that's where it starts, right there. Don't listen to mom and dad. Who cares what they say? They, they don't know. Everybody else knows but them. I, I know this is this is tough, challenging stuff. <coughs> it's absolute truth, tough stuff. So my, my responsibility is to point you to Jesus. You gotta hear the gospel. And, and now, once you hear it, it's on you. You to believe, to confess, to repent, to be baptized, and to rise and walk in. The Holy Spirit moves you now. Don't quench, press, or grieve him on me. 
to equip and deploy. C, remember, our, our mantra, all right? The last could say, the saved, empowered, empowered, equipped, equipped, get deployed. That's on us. But your part, you got some, that confess part. Tough, tough chapter. But, but just the second coat, guys. Just the second coat of this book. It's the gospel. Chapter two, here we go. Remember, that his limitless kindness and forbearance and patience is meant to lead you to where? Where are you supposed to go with all that kindness, that forbearance, <laughs> that patience? To repentance. That's where you go. Forbearance. That is a gift and a quality many people do not have. What is it? It's restraint. It, it is self-control. It's him, the Lord, holding back his wrath because he's doing that. But it's coming. And, and to a degree, we're seeing it. We're seeing it. So due to the rebellion, which man clearly is rebelling, and it's just simply that rebellion, choosing creation over the creator. Their hearts, your hearts when you do that, become hard and pain. And that is bad. That is dangerous because that heart condition, the impent part, comes and stores up wrath for you to be leveled upon you. And there is no greater wrath than the wrath of God. And there you go again, Pastor Hyde, and there's God's wrath. Listen, listen, here, here's our God. Second Peter 3 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So, so don't say he's out there stomping on people. God doesn't have to store up his wrath either. He does, but he don't have to. Remember, man reaps what he sows. What are you sowing? What fruit have you produced? What works can you show your creator? Don't mishear me on that. It's not works. Grace. Let's read in chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. He will render to each one according to his works. What's that say? To those who by patience... In well-doing, seek for the glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. But for those who are seeking and do not obey the truth, but to obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. And I know you're probably like, why did you read verse 8, Pastor? You could have left verse 8 out. You, you got to get the truth in the open. And I love these. So, so I must include all of it, because I give an account. God has given me a standard as minister of the gospel, James 3 1. Not many of you should become teachers. James is warning people, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So, does that mean greater wrath and fury? I'm not taking a chance. No way. I love this, but I'm not taking a chance. And God shows partiality. Look, look at, look at, look at, look at the verse 11. For God shows no partiality, He shows none. Did I say you should have Well, that was mine. I'm sorry. Okay? Yeah, to me. Okay. Anyway, and so this perfect standard is required, expected, commanded, and given to all of us. Everybody gets the same standard. But many just don't choose it. But that's pretty fair when you say everybody gets it all. That's fair. God gives you the choice. So verses 12 to 29 talk about God's judgment and law. We're gonna, we're gonna, that's going to take another cover. But what is his judgment standard? This, the Bible, his word, the gospel, his law, holy and perfect. That's, that is the standard. So what do you do about it? What, what's the answer? You obey people. You obey this. We must obey all of it. If not, we are judged by it. What would you rather? You get to choose. I can obey some of it sometimes. What, what's that get me? You know. You know what that gets you. Chapter 3. I know this is, listen. Second cover. We see God's righteousness is upheld in verses 1 through 8. We see that. All right? And, and our failings and our brokenness does not at all call out God saying, He made us this way. It's got to be His fault. If we're a mess, because He's a mess. We blame the sovereign God of it all, holy and perfect, that it's his mistake. You're, you're not a mistake, and he don't make mistakes. So, so let's, do, let's, do, let's read here. The truth is, we are all under sin. And this is where it gets really challenging for billions of people. All right? Verses 9 
to 20. What then? Are we Jews any, any better off? No, not at all. So we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Everybody, as it is written, no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Turned. They have become worthless together. No one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of the ass is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be stopped. And whoever, what the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. It's like the Bible did that. Now we know what's going on. That's another reason people don't want to read it. Because it calls out their condition. And this is big. People, I don't want to beat this point up, but it must be beaten. The critical point is it relates to, as it relates to the law, we must be aware of our condition. Without Christ, but the start of it all, we're sinners. We are not justified in his sight. This is our condition without him. The lost must be told. They must be convinced that they are lost. Apart from Christ, if you hear, you believe, the next action step, the confession part, is probably the most challenging. Why? Because you have to admit you're guilty. You are a sinner and you need a savior. For all have sinned. There isn't any distinction. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. You, you guys ever get lost driving somewhere? Yeah, absolutely. I know how it is. Me, me and Jen lost many times. And I always hear, turn around, you're, we're lost. And I would say, no, we're not lost. You might be lost, I'm not. I know where I'm going, okay? So just hang in there and we'll eventually find it out. She, and she will say, no, we're going to get more lost. And then we're really, and, and, and why, why am I behaving that way? We're not lost. I'm found, man. I know right where I'm going. It's pride. It is always going to be that. It is pride. We don't want to confess that we're a sinner. There ain't nothing wrong with me. I'm a good guy. My scales prove it. Look at the work I do. I, I come to church. Here I am. I'm a good guy. Sinner. You need to say it. You, you need to know your condition. Lost. We've all been there. And, and I know I hear a lot of people because when, when, when God calls out the wrath on his people, it's the wicked. It's the godless, and it is the religious. That group thinks, I'm good. I'm religious. I'm here, aren't I? So I don't sit in the defendant's seat. They're guilty. I sit in the jury box waiting to cast the verdict because I'm a religious dude. And now, who did Jesus call out the most? The religious dudes. Chapter 4. Big thing, the premise of the book is you live righteously in Christ by faith, or face God's wrath. Okay, the faith thing now. Abraham, this is a, an awesome lesson of, of Abraham. Okay, and his faith was credited to him as righteousness. God's <coughs> gift to Abraham was faith, gifted him with faith. What does Abraham's faith do? Abraham's faith moved him. Abraham is not passive in his faith. Now, now, now turn with me to Genesis 22. And, and we're flipping all the way back here. And, and uh, Genesis 22, and I'm going to read this thing. I want you to see any passivity with, with in Abraham's reaction and response. Okay? Listen to, listen to what happens. The man said, okay, 21 to 14. All right, that, that's completely wrong. Oh, Genesis. I'm in mean, Exodus. Okay. All right, sorry. Okay. Exodus, okay. That's true. Yeah, I know, I know, that's the first quote, right? Okay. Yeah. 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 Grace, grace, so triumphs over, mercy triumphs over judgment. Right. <laughs> I'm not lost, I'm very rushing. Yeah, I know, right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so here's, here's Abraham getting past. There's no debate, is there? Do you see the debate? 
Abraham's like, what? Well, what about the covenant? <coughs> Abraham rose early. Rose early in the morning, sat on his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac, and cut the wood for the burnt offering, and arose, and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes. He's there for three days, contemplating all this. He's going to kill his son, and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship, over and worship, and kill my kid, and come again to you. Did you see any passivity here at all? This is all action, people. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac, laid it on his son. And he said, and took the knife and the fire in his hand. And they both went together. And Isaac said to his father, uh, hey, dad. Uh, uh, his, son, his dad said, I'm going to you. Here I am, son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the, uh, where's the offering, dad? All right. And, and listen to this amazing response. God said, God will provide for himself a lamb for an offering, my son. And so they both went together. And when they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, he laid the wood in order, bound, bound, tied up his son, laid him on the altar on top of the wood, took out the knife to slaughter his son. And it was right there. It wasn't it's not going to be like a stab thing. It was going to be a throat cut. Can you imagine taking your son and be ready? Can you imagine this ask? But just then the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your only son from me. And Abraham looked at his eyes and looked the whole Behind him was a lamb caught in the thicket by his horn, oh, horn. And Abraham went and took the ram, offered it as a burnt offering instead of Isaac. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said, if on this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And, and then we know that, that the Lord says, declares the Lord, because you have not withheld your, your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring the stars of heaven as at the sand on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess, possess the gate of all his enemies. Man, that, that, that was a close call, though, right? I mean, do, do you think God, he, he waits till the very end? He, he knows what he's doing, people. He, he knows what he's doing. What does your faith do? It, it, and and here, here it is. Does it move you? Does it fully convince you? Because it says Abraham was fully convinced. When something fully convinces you, you go all in, don't you? Unless it means pain and suffering, Abraham's fully convinced. See, God promised that he would have a son, and the covenant would be established with Isaac. Look at this, Genesis 17, 21. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. Before it even happened, the covenant was established. Abraham was fully convinced. Allow the gift of faith to God to move you. Have joy in it. Don't be passive. Be fully convinced. convinced. And guess what happens? Amazing blessing. We, we, we check it out way before. I mean, you can't blame Abraham for what to probably say. Wait a minute. He didn't. He trusted. See, God is good for his word. He is good for his promises. You believe him. Live and step into that place. Faith equals peace. It gets us justified. Gets us access to God's grace in which we stand. We rejoice in the hope and the glory of God. Also, we rejoice in our sufferings. Our sufferings, just like our sacrifice, which is denying self, not worshiping self, like we've seen in the first five chapters of the book. Worshiping self. You take up the cross. Look at all the personalization. Personal faith, personal justification, personal access, our personal stance, our personal rejoicing, our personal suffering, our personal cross. Look at that. Don't be passive. The sufferings equal endurance. Endurance equals character. Character equals hope. Hope equals God's love, and it is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You've got to have the Lord. Verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Us. Christ's blood justifies us. But much more, now we are saved by Christ from God's wrath. Understand, before Jesus, we were all enemies. Now we are reconciled to God by the death of Christ. Much more now that we are reconciled. This is good news, people. It's starting to get good. Shall we be saved by his life? That's a cause for rejoicing, people. 
Sin comes into the world by one man. Anna did that. We did that. It spread to all mankind. But far greater is the free gift, so much more that we have the grace of God. That free gift, by grace of Jesus, he abounds for us. One man brought him condemnation. Jesus brings justification. You got him? Do you have Jesus? That life, life for all men. How does it happen? One man's disobedience, Adam, us. So by one man's obedience, Jesus, men will be made righteous. That's some really good news. Chapter 6, now it still gets a little bit ugly. You're just hanging there. The more sin, then, the more grace, right? Okay, we want, we want more grace, we sin more. Don't play games. Let's increase the sins because, because then grace is not. Don't play games. Here's, here's what we talk transformation. The former condition, you, before Christ, equals death. The new condition, with Christ, equals life. People, we've got to confess and acknowledge the human condition without Christ is death, rot, decay, stink. What is sin like? See, we don't take sin serious, people. We simply won't take sin serious. And what it does to us, this is what it does. Now, I want to give you the, an accurate picture of what sin uh, is and what it does. What it does to people outside of Christ. Here's what it's like. You know, I, I like the rack. You guys like the rack? They give you a little machine that you lock up and then they, they crank your limbs until everything slowly rips. Painful, isn't it? Well, there's another medieval punishment. It's like the, the market. It, it's called the maggot garment. Okay? And, and there's a lot of words for it. So what would happen is in the medieval times, they come up with some crazy stuff. But this is what sin does. Convicted murderers would then have a convicted criminal sew to their back a rotting corpse. They would sew a rotting corpse to the back of convicted murderers. And what, what do you think happened when the rotting corpse was sewed to your back? Now the rotting corpse would do what? It would stink, it would decay, it would infect, and it would attract what? Maggots. And then the maggots would eat the corpse, what else would they eat? The new, the new flesh, right? The, the, the healthy flesh. Can you imagine the existence of that person? And they would just kind of let them go. And what would happen? Slowly being infected with that stink, rot, and maggots eating them alive. That's what sin does to people. We, we don't recognize that. No, it doesn't. Yeah, that's what it's doing. That's what it's doing. You, you want to take that serious? You want that sewed to your back and into your heart? I don't think so. We need to take sin serious. We just we have to, people. We have to understand our condition. People don't want to admit that. People don't want to admit sin. They don't want to believe in hell and punishment. But we have to understand where we're at. Romans 6. All right. Second call. Let me just read verses 1 to 4. What shall we say then? Are we continuing sin and grace one God? By no means. How can we, who died to sin, still live in it? Do you not know all of us who have been baptized in Christ were baptized in his death? We were back, buried therefore with him by his bat baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Hear the word. Believe it. Confess. And you're, you're a sinner. And you're a savior. Repent. Change direction. Be baptized, rise, and walk in it. The old self has been crucified with Christ. United in his death. This brings the body of sin to nothing. Washed clean, spotless, clothed in righteousness so that we no longer would be enslaved to sin. You get that only through Jesus. For the one who has died in Christ has been set free from sin. And when you find yourself in the battle, you know what's happening. You're grieving, you're quenching, you're suppressing the Holy Spirit. Stop doing it. Because once you fall into sin and temptation, you lose that battle every time. Check verse 8. Now, we have died with Christ. We believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will no, never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So that you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Let sin, therefore, not reign in your mortal body to make it obey your passions. Do not present your members of sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and the members of God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not in the law, but under grace. You are no longer slaves to sin. You are slaves to righteousness. You obey the, you, you serve, you are a slave to the one you obey. It's either sin or obedience. 
Verse 17, but thanks be to God that those who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. In critical moment of truth here, you were a slave to sin, now you were a slave to obedience. Obedience to what? The standard of teaching to which you were committed. The gospel, God's word. From the moment of your conversion, this now is the standard for all of your life, now and forever. Perfect standard. And you get help. The Holy Spirit helps you live that way. Verses 20 and 23. Close it up here. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and in its end eternal life for the ways of sin. Now I'm going to hold off for a little bit. Just listen. Listen, some, some people are like, hey, I don't really care about your righteousness. Remember, we talked about that. We're, they're free in regard to righteousness. I don't need to live that way. I can live however I want. I don't care about being righteous. They, they don't have to care. But, but boy, it's going to matter. They can live however they want. But the Bible says, what's the fruit of living the way you want to live? What's the fruit of that? It's shame. And the result of shame is death. That's the fruit you get if that's what you choose to live. Forget righteousness. The end, death. It's the diseased, rotting, maggot-infested corpse sewed to your back. That's what you get. You go and set free people. You become a child of God. You accept Jesus Lord and Savior. The fruit now, as, as a believer, the fruit now leads to what? Sanctification. And in its end is eternal life. This verse here is so critical for all humankind. Paul is summoning the gospel here in one verse. Verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Our Lord. How, how people can you choose death over life, darkness over life, sin over Christ? How does that happen? Jesus calls you to choose him over sin. See, God offers a free gift again today. He offers Jesus. Let me give me prayer to that. Father, I, I thank you that, that Lord, your, your, your word is powerful. It, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates everything. Everything in us and about us. So, Father, we, we have the choice. You, you've blessed us with a free will deal. But, Father, we've heard the word. Now, we choose to believe it or not. There's no in-between. So, Father, then it becomes get rid of pride, Get rid of any fear. It becomes confession now. We confess that we are sinners, that we need a Savior, His name is Jesus. That we repent, change direction, change behavior, change thinking from unhealthy to holy. And then, Father, we're baptized and we rise, rise and walk in you. Father, I, I thank you. Bless these people in a mighty way. Be with them. Show them, Father, there's some being proud of right now. So, Father, I pray in, in, in a mighty way, in a loving way, like you, you always do. So, I move them. That, that they be fully convinced that they're doing what they need to do now. And move them up. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so people, the, 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 the remission part of that, the condition part of that, is we have to acknowledge where we're at. We, we know that Paul is saying to the people that. I'm, I'm here. It's a court. It's a courtroom type situation. Okay? And God's wrath is leveled upon the wicked. And you can say, well, I'm not wicked. I, I, I know you're not. Our hearts, though, be careful. Be careful. The, 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 the godless. Well, I'm, I'm doing okay. I, I don't have the, the, faith, the best relationship with right now. But I wouldn't say I'm godless. Be careful. And then the religious. The guys, that, that includes us. Because I, I know it's, I know a lot of times, I, I, if I was sitting there, I'd be saying, you know, I'm, I know I'm not wicked, and I know I'm not godless, and, I, and I, I, I'm not self-righteous, am I? But when we start feeling that way, looking that way, judging that way, then guess what happens? Yeah, you're, you're leveling the same on you. You're doing it with someone else. So, so right now, the reality is there are some, there are some folks here that haven't done, they haven't, they may have heard, they may have believed, they may have confessed, they, they, they may have repented of the community, they've sent them baptized, they're going to hold off a little bit. Why would you do that? 
So maybe, maybe they've held off. But rise and walk anyway. What does that look like? You're not the same anymore. You're, you're choosing life. You're choosing life for death. It, it takes courage. It takes boldness. It takes you stepping out and saying, that's what I want. I want Jesus over sin. I don't want the body and the magic infested corpse on me anymore, following me with me everywhere. I don't want it. So, so the free will, God's saying, let's see. Let's see. He sees your, your heart right now, and you can walk in. And so what can we do? Either way, he's got you. We don't know how many people will make it until next week. And guess where you go? With him. He's righteous, he's perfect, he's holy, he's just. He'll get you. He loves you. He loves you. You have Jesus. Yeah. You gotta understand your condition. You gotta have Jesus. The wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is, is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Are you saying?
that's it. Completely comfortable with this. <laughs> uh, I, she's very shy, you know, and she's such a kind of sweet, incredible spirit. I just love her. And she says, you know, it's good time. Woo! And then so. <laughs> Thank you. 